to be here. Um, as I've been so nicely introduced, my name is Crystal Dozier. I am an archaeologist, real life, in person. Uh, I don't quite look like Indiana Jones, I'm afraid. And uh, I found that the hat and the whip is kind of cumbersome in the field experience. I've never had the chance to punch a Nazi in the face. A little disappointing in that regard. Um, but that being said, archaeology is the most fascinating discipline um, to me, at least, uh, other than economics, uh, on the planet. So I'm really excited to talk to you all today about the long overview of history uh, that humans have shared. Um, overall, my overall research interest is, is how do people live in peace and productivity? How do we, as a species, get along um, in an environment where we're constantly competing for resources? Um, in order to achieve this, I'm, I use the archaeological record to inform upon this. Um, and I'm especially interested in how food systems uh, work for people. That is, how do we feed uh, everyone on this planet and continue to feed everyone on this planet? So, sound good? Awesome. Excellent. So uh, we are going to move very quickly because uh, I said 35,000 years, but in truth we're going to squeeze in 200,000 years of economic history. You betcha. You guys got a deal today. Uh, so we're going to take a global perspective. I'm not going to do uh, too much about talking about particular places and times. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on two events in human history that I think were really transformational. Um, the first being the Neolithic Revolution, and the second being the Industrial Revolution. So I'm going to skim through large parts of human history, but making sure we hit the highlights. Um, if you have any questions or if you need me to slow down, uh, just wave your hands fanatically. I'll try and see you. Um, but otherwise, 35,000 years, let's get started. Sounds good? Excellent. All right, so we're going to start 200,000 years ago in what some people know as the Ice Age, uh, made popular through, uh, I think that's a DreamWorks movie, the Ice Age. Um, I'm afraid nothing like reality. Um, instead, the Pleistocene environments looked much closer to this. Um, we're talking megafauna, we're talking um, ice sheets covering most parts of North America up until just north of here, actually. Um, with dramatic changes in the climate during the Pleistocene, where on average it's cooler and wetter, but the uh, predictability of that weather is much less reliable. Um, so the environments all across the world look very different than what the environment we're used to looking today in. Um, because there was so much glaciation, almost uh, coasts, at least in, Uni in North America, were about 100 uh, miles further out than their present day location. So the geography as well as the climate was totally different. This is the environment in which humans uh, first emerged starting in Africa. So um, the first evidence we have of modern Homo sapiens, that's our species, uh, originates in Africa sometime between 200 and 300,000 years ago. Um, for over half of our human history, we only have evidence of human beings in Africa. That is a full half of our history is within that continent. After that, we have archaeological and paleontological evidence of humans spreading um, across the globe. Uh, humans spread first to uh, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, somewhere around in the Levant, somewhere around 100,000 years ago. Then moving south, reaching Australia, 60 to 50,000 years, which is 10,000 years before we made it up to Europe. Europe was pretty cold at the time, wouldn't re recommend. Uh, North and South America was the very last places to be colonized by humans, uh, somewhere between four, 14,000 to 15,000 years ago. Um, though we're still finding evidence of the earliest peoples in all of these areas. Um, so the, this covers our first 75,000 years of human history is just moving across 
the planet. Um, during this whole exploratory period of human history, uh, humans conducted a foraging economy. This is hunting and gathering. Now, there's a common misconception about what a foraging economy looks like and what life is like for hunters and gatherers. You're probably familiar with this Thomas Hobbes quote from the Leviathan um, that life in this period with no arts, quote, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger, violence, death, the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You've, you've probably heard this quote before, and I'm afraid as much as Hobbes had some really great ideas about a lot of things, he was wrong about the life of the ancient foragers. Um, and to bring it back to uh, several points, first of all, we know that human beings are not solitary creatures. We always live in a group. Uh, the base level of community for human beings is 100 people. That's a, that's a breeding population. That's the number of people you have to know in order to keep a healthy um, set of people to make children with. Um, so, and we need other people to survive. Uh, so we're, we've always moved in groups of hundreds of people. Um, I can't say much about poor because that depends on your definition of poor, but nasty, brutish, and short are also incorrect. Um, is that while there are evidence for interpersonal violence, the occasional you know, arrow to the back, um, there is not a systematic warfare during this period that you see in other periods of human history. So the actual rate of injury and the rate, uh, your risk of being, having a violent de death is much lower in this period of human history of hunters and gatherers. Think of it this way too, if you know all of the 100 people in your, in your uh, circle, you're much less likely to create conflicts with them that can result in violence if you can work it out individually with everyone you know, right? Um, that being said, a foraging economy does, is not necessarily the luxury and comfort that we expect today, right? Um, the division of labor and what you might expect in these, this early stage of uh, human experience is based on the division of labor uh, based on gender. Not necessarily as you might expect with the men being the hunters and the women being the gatherers. Rather, we know that among foraging uh, societies that women do a large amount of hunting and men do a large amount of foraging. In fact, uh, the only hard and true lines of the gender division in terms of work is that men will hunt the large aquatic animals, here we're talking whales, um, and lifting extremely heavy objects for which they are biologically more suited for. Um, and the female roles are more uh, constrained to child rearing, uh, which again, there's a strong biological connection to, as well as cooking, uh, which is highly related to feeding those children, right? Um, in societies in which there is more than one gender role, those which develop generally later in time, those are tied to ceremonial roles uh, or religious roles as well, right? Uh, so, uh, in this respect, Adam Smith, our favorite, uh, maybe father of economics, was exactly correct that the original division of labor is based on demographics, right? How fit you are, how young you are, and whether you're male or female. However, through time, um, as humans colonize the world and population grows, you, we have this issue of population packing. That is, there's more and more people on the same amount of space. So if you look at this graph, as population density increases over time, uh, the land use intensity increases. What that means is people need to extract more and more resources out of the same period, same amount of land. Um, and if you have more competition over limited resources, as you might expect, there are a couple of outcomes. One of the outcomes is violence and conflict, and the other outcome is, is cooperation. I am really interested in this space of when do human beings choose violence and when do human beings choose cooperation, right? Um, and so during this, uh, this period in which there is an increased population on the landscape, all over the world we see human beings coming to a similar kind of um, result. And this is what I like to call the feasting economy. Um, the feasting economy refers to competitive feasting. 
It's this idea that we're gonna get everyone you know in a room and feed them food, and they're more likely to appreciate what you say if you give them a full belly. Uh, this has benefits both for the uh, participants of a feast, because you get to eat something, and usually it's pretty good. I think in this experience, we're all enjoying a feast right here. It's usually really good, right? And then the benefit of hosting the feast is that everybody is listening to you, and you have more op uh, opportunities for trade and for uh, collaboration, right? So um, this is a cooperative form of economy that brings people together from a large uh, geographic area. So you can start to get long distance trade occurring through these feasting events. Um, you also see that this is a form of social entrepreneurship in a way. This is a way for an individual to create social standing for themselves within a group by organizing these large feasting events. Um, and there's a lot of repercussions for this kind of feasting economy that has direct implications for what I'm about to talk to. Um, the first is that in hosting a feast, you want to impress your guest. So there is an investment into what are luxury goods, especially luxury foods. Uh, and that's a good way to get people on your side is to have um, good food, and especially, it seems, in this period, um, if you can serve it on fine china, so something like pottery, or uh, serve them something to uh, make them feel good, something like alcohol or another mind-altering substance. Um, this is also you an emphasis on meat, protein, fats, and starches. Um, these are basal instincts of human beings because they're really delicious, and if you cook them well, they're especially good. So this feasting economy um, is what I study quite a lot. Happens at different times across the world, again, as population densities get high enough that human beings need to find a way to, uh, to get along. Um, one of the earliest um, examples we have of this feasting economy is at the famous site of Lobleki Tepe. Uh, this is a monumental site in uh, southern Turkey where um, you can see this reconstruction here. It is a ceremonial complex associated to be, have some kind of a religious aspect. 11,000 years ago, these peoples were hunters and gatherers, completely foragers. Um, building incredibly complex um, temple situation, um, coming together from likely hundreds of miles across the landscape. Um, again, showing that uh, religion predates uh, government. Government doesn't bring along the religion. The re religion um, predates the government. Um, and it also predates domestication. These are people who are moving seasonally, they are not practicing agriculture. There are no domesticated foods. But in the areas around Gobleki Tepe, they've found evidence of feasting. That they're having large quantities of foods that are all wild and caught in, in forage, but being brought to this location in order to build and to celebrate this piece of monumental architecture, which is quite amazing. Um, and this, this period of feasting is seen in all sorts, all different regions of the world that immediately precedes what I think is probably the most important transition point um, equal to the Industrial Revolution, and that is the Neolithic Revolution. Who's heard of the Neolithic Revolution? All right, so like some of you took an anthropology class. All right, for those of you who haven't, here's your introduction. The Neolithic Revolution is the time in which humans went from foragers to settled agricultural communities. Um, so this is where you move into full-time agricultural production, where instead of gathering your resources year by year, that you are um, planting them and harvesting them. This also means that you need to stay for a long period of time in one area. Uh, so you see long-term permanent settlement. You see buildings out of stone. Um, and along with this, um, more consistent form of food production. Um, you also see specialization into different forms of economies. This is where you see pottery production explode. This is where you see um, textile production explode. This is where you start to see the orange, origins of metallurgy. 
all of the fundamental crafts have their origins in the Neolithic Revolution. Um, in addition to, to the benefits of specialization, uh, having a stable starch food source means that you can make gruel, which means you can wean your babies earlier, which means that you can have more children. So this, this time period is also associated with um, decreased birth spacing, meaning you're having increased population. It's a good way to have more children, right? Uh, there are, of course, setbacks in, in all of these transitions that we're talking about. Um, and one of the, the could be argued as a setback in this is that you start to see the origins of inequalities in this period. Among foraging peoples in which everything is more or less shared, um, and your role is determined by uh, your health and your gender, right? Uh, things are relatively equal. Um, whereas when you start to move into these um, agricultural societies, here you start to see um, hereditary inheritance of property, and therefore, um, and differences in who has access to the best foods and who has access to the less good foods, right? Um, but we can't. Um, dismiss the real importance of what happens in this trans transition. And I think the most important one has to be uh, the domestication of various foods. So the domestic domestication speaks to the process of genetically altering an organism to fit humanity's needs. Does anyone know what the oldest domesticate is? Potato. Potato? Dog. I heard dog somewhere on the left. Congratulations, sir. You win prize and acclaim from the audience. Uh, dogs are the oldest domesticate. Uh, dogs were, were actually domesticated prior to the Neolithic Revolution, sometime between 40 to 20,000 years ago. So dogs followed humans into Europe, into Northern Asia, and into North America. Um, most societies do not eat their dogs, some do, um, but they're useful for a lot of other things. Uh, instead, the Neolithic Revolution really focused on food domesticates. We're talking about everything we eat today. If there was something on your plate from lunch today that was wild, I will hand you $20. Because I bet you everything on your plate from lunch today was, is either fully domesticated or cultivated. And probably almost everything was completely domesticated. This completely alters um, what the plants look like and what human beings can extract from those plants and animals, right? Um, over, there's a whole other topic part of this that I want to talk about that I argue that this domestication process happened inadvertently um, because there are aspects of plant breeding that humans can't control. There are aspects that we can, but there are aspects that we cannot. And rather that it's our time working with these plants for the feasting economies that help transform them into uh, the plants and animals that we uh, enjoy today. Um, of human action, not human design is a phrase I borrow from uh, Frederick Hayek, who we're going to talk about in just a little bit. To give you an example of how important this transition was, I want to give you a couple examples. The first being maize, or corn, as we, we commonly call it here in Kansas, right? So the wild form of cans of corn is a wild tropical grass called teosinte. It's a bush that grows about yay high. Its kernels run in a single row with a hard, inedible kernel on the outside. The casing is on the outside. It's not something you can bite into. And there's not a lot of evidence that human beings tried because it would crack your teeth. Instead, human beings use this plant to press out the sap to make a, a fermented alcoholic beverage out of. Um, I, I promise you. <laughs> um, but through time, by interacting with this plant, oops, we were able to transform it from this tiny little individual kernel to this, um, the base starch for one third of the world's population. One third of today's population gets one third of their calories from maize alone. Um, and we transformed this wild plant that only grew in central Mexico to something that grew from Canada down to the Andes, right? And, and quadrupled the production of its edible parts, notwithstanding the genetic modification in the 1970s, which 
doubled the production of maize today. Another example uh, I like to use is cows. Um, beef, one of our favorite uh, meat products. So uh, you've never seen a wild cow because they are extinct. A wild cow is called an auroch. So imagine yourself a, a, a cow, right? They're pretty big. But imagine that this one is the meanest thing you ever saw, and it was two feet taller, and its horns were three feet longer, and it wanted to kill you. That was an auroch. And that was the wild uh, form of a cow. And that is what um, was domesticated first in Turkey um, at sites really close to Gobleki Tepe. And Gobleki Tepe, they were hunting these wild aurochs for their feasts. 2,000 years later, and um, sites like um, Chatelhoyuk, they're eating domesticated cows. Can anyone tell me one last example? Because food is my favorite thing to talk about. Can anyone tell me what this plant is? Potatoes. No, not a potato. Oh. You would think it looks like a weed. Let me ask you this. Do you know what these plants are? All of these are the same plants domesticated from this, oops, this wild form. This is a wild form of brassicas, which human beings have domesticated in all of these different forms, focusing on different parts of that plant. None of these foods would exist were it due to the Neolithic Revolution. Right? It's important. Have I convinced you that it's important? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, and since this is a, uh, oops. Since this is a talk about uh, economics, um, usually one of the questions I get, well, what about money? Certainly money has something important to do with the role of economics. And I'm actually going to downplay the role of money because it's the form of exchange that's more important. So uh, if you, there was a, a book published several years ago called Death the First 5,000 Years by David Graeber. Um, David Graeber became very famous because he was um, one of the founders of the, um, the um, what is it called? Against Wall Street? The protest against Wall Street? Occupy Wall Street movement. Thank you very much. Um, in which he argues that the origin of money is a way to symbolize debt that, that uh, the hierarchy has upon the common people. And again, this is another example where I'll point it out, this argument to say that it is wrong. Um, that, that, that's not a very accurate, I think, portrayal about the origins of money. Uh, because uh, money, all money, is symbolic, right? Um, is that in, it's a symbol of what a real bill is. We all know that if you take the piece of paper that we use for American currency, the American dollar, it, it, just as paper, it is relatively worthless. You can use it as toilet paper, but not have a lot of use otherwise, right? But as a form of currency that you can exchange for other goods, it has a lot of power, right? And that's the power due to the symbol that it holds and the trust that people put into that symbol. Um, we, uh, Adam Smith was the first, again, our father of economics, was the first to suggest, put in palatable writing, that human beings have a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. That's the famous phrase. Um, in which, yes, human beings do like to exchange, but I'm afraid Adam Smith was a little bit off here, uh, that a barter system doesn't seem very tenable. Uh, very rarely do we see circumstances where human beings get together and say, well, I'll give you two sheep for one cow, right? Um, more often what you see is reciprocal gifts. Well, you need this cow now. I'll give it to you now. I know that in, in a season your crops are going to come by and you'll repay with whatever you have, right? So this gifting exchange is much more common than in direct barter that some people like to think of, right? In one way, these reciprocal debts are um, enacted through feasting again, um, is through the trade of symbolic goods. So to take a real life exam example, you, we can look at, um, oops, sorry, uh, wampum beans, which are shell beans, which were a trade item for um, Native Americans in the Northeast, um, in which was exploited by early colonists. It's a fascinating story about how uh, English settlers 
commercialize the production of wampum beads to uh, enhance trade with indigenous northeastern tribes. Um, but also goes back again, back to the Neolithic to Turkey. So it's a little hard in this image to see, but here is Turkey, um, and here's um, the Levant, and here's Saudi Arabia. And all of these Neolithic sites have um, evidence of trade of obsidian. If you watch Game of Thrones, Dragon Glass. Um, obsidian traveling hundreds of miles prior to the domestication of horses, moved on foot hundreds of miles. Um, again, likely more symbolic than actually um, necessary for their qualities as trade good items. As a throw out to um, formalize money, right, um, it seems instead we have a gradual transition from um, some forms of symbolic money that's um, culturally recognized among different groups to institutionalized money that is produced by a, a state entity or a religious entity or a banking entity. Um, so the earliest uh, formal currency comes from Turkey. Um, about 640 BC, um, and it's the form of a gold coin. And the first paper money comes from China around um, 1000 CE or 1000 AD, when you have uh, established um, state entities, which is what I'm going to jump into next, the origins of the state. So once we have this Neolithic revolution, we have settled agriculturists living in dense communities, Populations, again, start to grow even faster because uh, agriculturalists can have more babies in less period of time. Um, that these centers of domestication for the major starch crops, corn, oops, corn, potatoes in South America, wheat and barley in the Middle East, yams in West Africa, millet in China, uh, become the origins of complex societies. Um, the origins of what we consider state-level societies, that is, those with a formalized governmental system. Um, and with a formalized governmental system, what that means is a formalized military power, the ability for one group to hold um, some form of, of action against other groups, um, primarily through violence, right? Um, and in this origins of the states, we have um, true institutionalized inequalities. That is where you have the origins of caste systems and guild systems. That is that your status in life is, is dependent on who your parents are, right? Um, and your ability to move in that, that society is dependent upon who your parents are. Um, however, you also have the proliferation of what is called the rule of law. Things like uh, Hammurabi's Code, which um, is not the first um, systems of conduct that humans adhere themselves to. That's what culture is, that's what religion is, right? But um, law that has been codified, right, and written emerges during this period. And so we're going to, during this, um, the origins of the state and through the um, the movement into these states grow into empires, I'm gonna move very quickly through. Um, and I'm gonna move very quickly through because the relative quality of life for the individuals um, grows very slowly. There are some exceptions to that in different empires, but for the average blue collar agricultural worker, um, not much in the quality of life changes. Um, the complexity in trade increases, Different goods um, are enhanced, metallurgy increases, um, different craft productions. You have the introduction of wheel spun pottery, right? So different technological advances. Um, and there are different, in different empires, you have different approaches to economic management. Um, in almost all of them, however, they are effective aristocracies. That is, that there is some kind of elite, either group or an elite family that is in charge and that those elite aristocracies also control a large portion of the um, economic activities within these states. Again, with variations among the different um, kinds. Um, there's expansion of military and economic relationships through the expansion of colonies, um, and increased wealth, especially for the upper class. 
So if you look at um, the quality of living for upper classes in, in empires such as the Roman Empire, the upper classes are, are, uh, are having indoor plumbing and heated floors. Uh, but uh, lower class individuals don't necessarily have increases of the quality of life at the same rate. Um, we see similar things among um, the empires such as the Han Dynasty in China or in the Incan Empire. The next um, kind of phase that we're going to be moving into is the Industrial Revolution, right? So this really starts with the mercantilist uh, stage in, and I'm going to talk from a Euro, primarily Eurocentric perspective here, um, that with the Colombian exchange, that is Columbus going from Portugal into uh, the Americas, that you have the interest of European powers into colonizing this new world, North and South America. This opens up new territories, new resources, and new markets. And at the end of the mercantilist uh, period, you see really changing governmental systems that really have fundamental uh, impacts that you start to see in the 16th, uh, or in the 17th and the 18th centuries. Um, let's try this one. Who's read The Wealth of Nations in this group? Oh, a little bit more? All right, excellent. If you if you've read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, published in 19, uh, 1776, it is um, kind of the first primary treatise on economics um, and history together, um, in which there's a whole bunch in there, and there's a whole lecture on Adam Smith I have inside of me that I'm constrained down. But the basic understanding of which is that the, during this period, we have the effervescence of different nations based on this division in, of labor, the specialization, and the beginnings of free trade and the Industrial Revolution. So I'm sure you all have heard, if you didn't hear of the Neolithic Revolution, you've probably heard of the Industrial Revolution, right? The period of time in which we move from an agricultural mode of production to an industrial form of production, right? Um, during this time period, um, which is incredibly complex and we have a lot more information about because we have the historical record in addition to the archaeological record. Um, we see less governmental action into, um, in some areas, into the actual trade and a conduct of different economies, um, which is related to this boom in technological advancement. This is the origin of machine labor. Right, where human beings are not responsible for all of the labor that goes into all of the goods. Um, and the results of the Industrial Revolution are, of course, an increased standard of living for almost everybody, um, from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, um, with a, a time delay for that as well. Uh, you also see increased population as fewer and fewer, um, honestly, as a child mortality decreases during the Industrial Revolution more than anything else. Um, and there's different forms of data that we can speak to the importance of this revolution. Um, the first is life expectancy at birth. So this is an example from England and various cities in England from the 1850s to the 1890s. Um, a steady boom, an increase of five to 10 years in, in how long you can be expected to live after the Industrial Revolution to the GDP, the gross domestic product per capita, so per person in various countries, very slow growth from 1,080, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, you hit 1,800 in a dramatic spike in um, the products and the labor being produced by these various countries. And then also you have societal impacts as well. So if you look in the increase of literacy in a country such as England, which was one of the first to industrialize, um, fairly low 20, oops, 20 to 40% literacy until you hit about 1860, and then bam, um, over 70% literacy for both men and women and following the Industrial Revolution. Really dramatic change into the way in which we think um, the quality of life for everyone happens, right? There's all sorts of different perspectives on um, how the Industrial uh, Revolution happened and how uh, that happened. One of the first writings was by Frederick Engels, uh, The Condition of Working Class in England in 1845. If you're not fam uh, familiar with Frederick Engels, he was co-writer with Karl Marx on the Communist Manifesto. 
So you, as you might expect, um, this trade is focused on the living conditions, working in uh, poor houses in England, um, which was very excellent use of data, but not a very good use of analysis of why and how this revolution happened. Instead, more uh, comprehensive, and I would say more, um, uh, more useful understandings come from one of my favorite guys, Max Weber, Max Weber who was an, the father of Austrian economics, who in 1905 wrote The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism that argued that it was a change in the religious ideals of Protestant workers in Northern Europe that helped uh, fuel the capitalistic revolution that resulted in the Industrial Revolution. This, um, I think a similar argument has been recently made by Deirdre McCloskey, um, who just finished publishing her bourgeois trilogy, um, which I highly recommend if you're interested, uh, the last being Bourgeois Equality, How Ideals, Not Capital or Institutions, Enrich the World. Um, I think she's online for the next Nobel Prize in Economics because it's a really fundamental prize. That might be the most controversial thing I've said all day. <laughs> all right, to kind of skim through the next... 20 years, um, the quality of life after the Industrial Revolution has not, um, depending on who you ask, more or less hasn't changed dramatically much. If you think of 1920, we are still, you had running water, you had, you get around on an automobile, life expectancy was maybe five, 10 years less than it was today, but uh, the standards of living in which most people enjoy were established in the Industrial Revolution. During the 1920s, there was um, an increased interest in um, um, socialist forms of government in which governments would take control of the central planning of economies. This idea of the experts that um, if you had enough knowledge and you put the right people in charge, they could figure out how to run the economy that would be best for everyone. Uh, this is a very popular idea and it's a very lovely idea. Um, I think it's the wrong idea. Um, that, and that's been borne out by the evidence of, of the collapse of most, if not all, of the socialist, early socialist governments of the 20th century, right? Uh, Frederick Hayek, this guy, one of my favorite guys, he wrote The Road to Serfdom, um, a really another excellent book I can uh, suggest to you, who argued that the, the fundamental problem is a knowledge problem is that there's no way to know, because the economy is so complex, there's no way to know exactly what variables are important to predict a certain industry. Um, he went on a series of debates with John Maynard Keynes um, on whether or not this would be possible for the government to be able to properly plan economies. Um, uh, and some of you are laughing if you're familiar with these debates. Um, in terms of uh, the economics, the ideas of Hayek have held true. Um, in terms of um, the politics, I think Keynes probably won through. Uh, because it's not a very politically salient perspective to say, well, the market goes for ups and downs, but the government should do nothing when the economy is in a downturn. That's not a very popular opinion for politicians to have, right? Um, um, in addition to the, the, the knowledge problem with uh, centralized planning, centralized planning also reduces the individual incentives to um, increase production, right? So Frederick Hayek won the Nobel Prize in Economics. Keynes died before he was able to be uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize. If you're interested in uh, this debate, I suggest you go to YouTube, and there is a rap battle between uh, great actors of uh, Hayek and Keynes. It's a lot of fun. If you can't sleep, put it on. It's a lot of fun. All right. And to wrap this up in the last uh, five minutes, um, we've moved now into, some, into what some scholars have called the new shared economy, if you've heard this term. Um, I don't deal with anything that is really this recent. So I have no idea um, whether or not we are in this new economic revolution, if the internet is such a huge um, impact force into the speed of communications and the nature of communications and human beings that it fundamentally changes the way in which economies are run. That is possible. I think I need a couple thousand years to decide that, right? A couple hundred at least, right? Um, 
but this is this this new economy form. Um, well, less, a lot of the world is, is still industrializing. It's still early to tell, right? So, in conclusion, um, if you take some some points away from this this talk, I hope that you get that culture and institution matters. That is the form of the culture and the form of the government in which individuals move have a huge impact on the ability for um, societies to become more complex and more um, inclusive and supportive, right? And a lot of this is based off of the idea of individual innovation, right? In a feasting economy, there was an, a motivation and a method, an institution, a way for individuals to advance their standing. Same with the Industrial Revolution. There was an impetus and a structure for ways to improve their own standing. In order for this to be effective, this means that individuals must have the ability for social mobility, the opportunity for individual social enhancement, right? That there is an incentive structure to produce more and be a productive member of society. And that in, in addition to that, that individuals have to feel secure in their personal liberties, right? Life, liberty, happiness, those kind of things, away from fear of, of death and persecution, right? Um, I also would like to, to argue that information is probably one of the primary advancements at each point of these huge revolutions in human history. That it is, is the knowledge of how to make new foods. It is the knowledge of how to make new technologies and the sharing of that information that made those revolutions uh, tangible, right? that made those re revolutions so impactful that they were able to spread. Right? And lastly, um, my, my last takeaway, again to paraphrase Hayek, that these are revolutions that happened of human action. Human beings did them, but each individual actor didn't realize they were part of the Neolithic Revolution or the Industrial Revolution. They just knew they were one small part um, to advance their individual lives. And so they didn't need to have that grand design in order to be contributing to these really important advancements of human society. All right, and with that, <laughs> we have time for three or four questions, and I'll get to you as soon as we can. Excellent. Please keep them short and concise. We'll start right here. Thank you for coming. Um, you touched on a little bit, but you uh, a little bit more time on the role of academics and academia in some of these uh, advancements. You want me to spend more time or less time on the academics? A little more time. Little more time. Um, uh, well, I guess if you're if you're wanting to do a, I'll, I hit the highlights of the books to be read uh, for this history. Um, I excluded some others. Um, Adam Smith, if you haven't read Wealth of Nations, uh, it's a beautiful treatise on the way that human beings interact. Um, and I think in its core principles, it's, it's hard to argue from a lot of the, the insights that Adam Smith has. He got some of the details wrong. It was in 1776. We'll give him some slack. Hi, hey, man. Appreciate the presentation. Your, your very last, the way you ended it, I thought was pretty interesting. Would you say that most societies end as a result of their attempt to bring things by design rather than just by Ooh, that's a great question. It's so loaded. Um, <laughs> it, it's, um, it's hard to say because we see the collapse of the classic empires, right? We see the class, collapse of the Inca, the collapse of the Maya, the collapse of the Romans, and it always happens after what is called the classical period, the time in which they're supposedly at their height of their arts and their culture, and also in the time in which their governmental forms are the most intensive. So there is definitely a correlation there. Um, whether or not it's causation is always hard to detangle. Um, I am of the um, perspective that, that the more involvement into um, the more intensive forms of government, especially since what we've seen in terms of the artificial production of famines, is, is usually the result of things like governmental mismanagement. So it seems reasonable that these kind of, govern, these kind of large collapses are at least partly to do with governmental mismanagement. Yes? 
Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I studied archaeology, total nerd, love this. Yeah. Um, so you described as we moved from foraging and migratory patterns and behavior to more stable locales, um, higher use of technology, things like that. Um, chaos or entropy almost seems to exist in our societal structures. What has balanced that throughout our history so that we just didn't devolve in absolute chaos? Ooh, great question. Um, and I think this is, speaks to the fundamental nature of culture, is that human beings, as, as a society, we are reliant on each other. We are, we are social creatures, and, I, and we are um, reliant on our culture. I think the best example that I can think of is the fact that human beings need cooked foods to survive. So that from our very infancy, human beings were cooking food, and cooking food is almost always a communal event. You share your food with others. And so I think from human origins, um, we've always had some structure to human relationships. And in that way that we're not barbarians in the wild, you know, fighting each other off, is that we've always had a family group, we've always had a community, and the, the, that family and community has rules. And um, to fair, paraphrase Mises, Max, um, um, Mises, um, there is freedom within those rules. Is that if everyone knows the rules, then we are free to engage in productive um, exchange. Thank you. Yes. How did the Dark Ages fit into Europe with you? Ooh, the Dark Ages of Europe. So I placed the Dark Ages um, in the Age of Empire, um, in this kind of, um, in the way that I, I divvied up human history. Um, and there is, of course, several different perspectives you can take. It can be the collapse of a classical period. Um, there is an environmental um, aspect to the, the Dark Ages as well. The medieval climate anomaly um, occurred during that period, which completely devastated crops in Europe, as well as um, had a huge impact on crop production in North America. So at the same time you had the Dark Ages in uh, Europe, you also had the collapse of several classical civilizations in North America. Right. Um, you also had the the political forms during that period were also heavily um, class and caste based. So there was not a lot of uh, opportunities for individuals in those societies for the individual advancement that I argue um, is so important to those those major revolutions. Last question. Was right over to you. Last question. Well, thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is directly related, the other one's kind of off and left field. Um, Neanderthals, which you didn't cover, there's a theory that Neanderthals did not go extinct, that they, are, that they were married into uh, our population, and, and I did the ancestry DNA, and I'm 5%, which is really high. Ooh, that is high. Yeah. So, now, a lot of you have seen that before. I know a lot of you have seen that before. So anyway, 5%. You mentioned the cow and the borax. And I'm, I'm I, right away, when you said this cow is extinct, my question is, do you think that's possibly the same thing as humans and Neanderthal? That that cow didn't go extinct, that it bred into the, the selective breeding that was going on, and that it's, it's alive today in the, in the cows um, that we see in the pastures in Kansas. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, to clarify, yeah, aurochs didn't, like, we didn't kill all the aurochs and start the cows, is that we domesticated the aurochs into cows, right? So, um, and aurochs, um, those that remained with those wild distinctions were then hunted to the point where they could not survive um, in, in independent groups, right? So the route of survival was domestication. Um, the Neanderthal question is really interesting. There's a lot of more and more research is coming out about the similarities between Homo sapiens, that's us, and um, most anthropologists are now adopting the use of the nomenclature Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, which means that Neanderthals are a cousin species to humans. Because we do know through ancient DNA that humans and Neanderthals interbred to some degree. 
um, both in Europe and in the Middle East. Um, it is possible that, that it is, it's whether or not human beings just assumed all of the Neanderthal population or if they died out is a question of, of population density and that's really hard to reconstruct from the fossil record. So how many Neanderthals were there to begin with is really difficult to say. But we know that at least some part of Neanderthal um, society interbred with human societies and in that way does continue in, in human, modern human lineages. Dr. Crystal Dozier, thank you very much.